evening campers it is me kieran and today we are going to discuss the first english novel published by a woman in zimbabwe we are going to discuss a book that changed the world according to the bbc in 2018 we are going to discuss Titi's Dangarambia's Nervous Conditions. As part of my Book of Boy Book Club. This is the first in a trilogy that Titi Dangaramba has spent 40 years writing. Nervous Conditions being the first, the Book of Not being the second, and this vulnerable body which has been nominated for the Booker Prize in 2020. Considering how lauded, how revered, how celebrated it is as a modern classic in African literature. I am astonished that there is only, hear me out, one book review of the entirety of YouTube, which is Sean the Book Maniacs, where he covers the entire trilogy. So I will link that down below so you can get another view of this book. But we need to do better, people. The audacity, the nervous conditions, has been flying off bookshelves, has been critically examined, has been celebrated across Africa. Yet no one but one person in 40 years has reviewed it is an absolute... How? How? Because how this book talks about colonialism, the impact of the colonized on native people of a land is sublime. So what's sublime about it? Okay, let's not focus on the text. Let's just look at the cover and this title, Nervous Conditions. And what is a nervous condition? In Fallon's introduction to The Wretched of the Earth, where this book takes its title from, a nervous condition is a it is something that causes a physical or emotional distress on a person and the sole thing they want to do is dispel it but i want to discuss the physical and the emotional aspects really what we are dealing with is not so much the colonizers we're also looking at the colonized our protagonist is tambudzai or tambu and we follow her story in this book and the next two novels and tambu comes from a traditional shona household she is uneducated and knows nothing of the modern colonized world mia miles away from her hometown. However, Namo, her brother, is given the privilege of education. Namo has not got the privilege of education through his own hard work, not because of his family's hard work. Instead, the money is gifted by Baba Mukuru, Tambu and Namo's uncle, who is a colonized African man who has been studying with white men in England. Baba Makuru has the status in a traditional Shona sense, but also in a colonized sense that his word is final. So Namo packs his bags and leaves to live in the missionary with Baba Makuru, his wife and kids. Does Namo have a better life? Well, it doesn't matter because the first sentence of this book is Tambu telling us, the reader, that she was not upset hearing of her brother's death. And this is what kickstarts Tambu's journey to education. Being now the eldest child, Baba Makuru pleads with the father and mother to say, let me be the one to educate Tambu. She will be able to provide so much for the family. She will be the person that she wants to be. And Baba Makuru being a strong man with status, wealth, and knows the way of the white man, they accept and Tambu goes with Baba Makuru. We can forget that 
Tambu had her own initiative and started working a fallow piece of land, uh, growing mealies or sweet corn so she could sell for an extortionate price to white tourists. So she funds her own education. Uh, let's just ignore that because Bab Makuru, he's the one you have to listen to. Upon Tambu moving into the mission house, we really have this clash of cultures. Baba Makuru's kids, Naisha and Chido, do not speak the Shona language fluently. Tambu tries really hard to speak English, which is now meant to be the tongue that she should be representing, because that is what the white man would dictate a educated woman to do. Tambu and Naisha's... Could you not? Thank you. Tambu and Nyesha's relationship strengthens and grows throughout this novel, but Nyesha has been brought up so anglicised that she struggles with the traditional Shona way, and even though she should be embraces the freedom that comes with an anglicised mind, she cannot escape Baba Makuru, who wants her to be a traditional woman. Anyone who disagrees with Baba Makuru's patriarchy is dealt with violently, with lashings, with beatings, with threats aplenty. But his wife, my guru, always tries to centre Baba Makuru, even if it means that she has to call him baby names, if she has to call him daddy, if she has to truly bow down to Bab Makuru. And I don't mean bow down in a metaphorical way. Traditional shoulder women physically bow down to Baba Makuru and everything that he says is greeted with celebration, with exclamations of Pururu, with feasts, with excess. He truly is the patriarchy. He is the head of the family. Nation knows that Baba Makuru's power is only there because history has allowed it. She challenges Baba Makuru in every way, shape or form, a truly angsty teenager. And though Tambu at times is scared and hiding in her bed, refusing to leave, Nisha is there whilst Bab Makuru is screaming at her, saying, don't worry, he's not actually going to follow through with anything that he says. And Tambu struggles with this because she feels that Bab Makuru is being good, kind and gentle to her. And Nisha sees him as a man who wants his own way. But Nisha is bound to two cultures and this causes an emotional distress. She stops eating at family meals and what we see is that she becomes thinner and thinner over the pages of this novel. Another showcase of what colonization can do is highlighted with Tambu's mother and Tambu's mother gives birth to a young boy and Baba Makuru instantly wants to take the child away when he is of age to the mission school to become educated. And Tambu's mum feels that Bab Makuru is taking the fattened calves and killing them for slaughter. She feels as though she's lost touch with Tambu, for Tambu's English is much stronger and she's struggling to remember the Shona language and the Shona ways. Namu, who was taken, has died. And slowly we see Tambu's mother fall into depression, which ultimately suffers the baby as this small child has diarrhea and Tambu's mum knows that if the baby has diarrhea it will die and she accepts that in some way and Tambu rather than being with her mother is taken once again from her home town to the mission school to focus on her studies and bettering herself.
We could argue that Tambu, now that she has access to education, has an opportunity to learn and better herself. And that's definitely what Baba Makuru and the other members of the family feel. But what Tsitsi Dangaramba is really emphasizing is that though she's uneducated, she has so much to unlearn. At the beginning of this novel, Tambu doesn't understand why roads are bumpy for cars but not for ox carts. She doesn't understand how a car can move through a shallow river. She doesn't even know what a traffic light is. Yet as we go through with her in her education, she's reading Louisa May Alcott's Little Women, as though that is going to enlighten her in some way. Tambu's incessant craving for literature means that she only focuses on fictional works. And we see Tambu has this idea of what the world has in store for her. And whilst she's reading fiction and classics, Nisha's only we did non-fiction. She's focused on the facts of the matter. And we see that Nisha knows that the fact is she will never be able to be a native of her country and a native of the colonized country. She is stuck somewhere in the middle where two countries will never accept her and the emotional breakdown that you will read at the end of this novel is heartbreaking. You might notice that I haven't actually spoken much about Tambu in this review and it's more so to do that this really is Tambu's story. Tambu serves as a vehicle, I believe, to view how the women are struggling within this time of colonialism, of post-colonialism, of traditionalism and heritage, and how they never, ever will work together. Now, I must add that if you desire strong women in your stories, nervous condition will tick that box multiple times for you. Are they the most well-rounded women in literature? No, but their lack of definition emphasizes Dangaramga's point exquisitely. As I'm now starting to meander away from theme, let's zoom out and let's talk about the reading experience of nervous conditions. Did I enjoy this book? I, <laughs> I would summarize my experience of this book as somewhere between utterly enthralled and completely bored. We'll say that the timeline of this story is vaguely interesting. I didn't hate it. I think it's quite clear to tell that I have mixed emotions on this book, but I will say it's not a waste of your time. What this book has made me ponder about, ruminate about, really think about is colonialism, the impact of colonialism. And have we even reached a post-colonial state? What Tsitsi Dangaramga is trying to tell us is that the colonized are always going to suffer. Colonization will never stop just because the colonizer has set off the land. For me, this is a six out of 10, but I am interested. I'm oh so interested to see where the second book, the book of not is going to pick up. So if you're interested in my views on that, please be sure to subscribe because later on this week that review will be up as soon as I read it. Please know there's also a discord link 
down below where like-minded people are also reading all of Dan Granger's novels. So click that and you can talk to like-minded people and see their views on it. Have you read it? Are you interested? Do you agree or disagree? Please let me know down in the comments and I will see you later on this week again for the Book of Not. Bye!